Well, welcome everybody to the World Affairs Council second webinar using Zoom. We thank you for tuning in. Uh, we had a very positive and successful one just a few weeks ago about COVID-19 and diplomacy, and we've shifted gear just a tad bit uh, to talk about the subject today, which is um, what we all love, animals, or most of us who um, uh, uh, have pets and who um, are animal advocates. Um, in just a little bit, we'll be talking to Tim Morrow with the San Antonio Zoo. Um, Magdalena is uh, monitoring the chat line, so, so uh, she'll be looking at any questions that come up there, and we'll also be looking at the Q&As um, if you have any questions coming up. And we really uh, thank our members, our council members, um, and our viewers who uh, um, are supporting us. Uh, I want to specifically thank our board. I think it bears to mention who they are, who are watching, because um, they are our advocates. They are what makes my job a lot easier. Uh, Julie Weber from UIW, Peggy Pace, uh, Rear Admiral A.B. Cruz, Sherry Dohlat Shahi, who's with the City of San Antonio and Global Engagement, Colonel Bill Rasco. Uh, we also have some friends from the San Antonio Council of International Visitors. Um, <clears throat> our sister agency. So thank you all for um, tuning in. And uh, a lot of our animal friends and several Rotarians, so I, I thank you all for uh, what is to be a good discussion. Uh, something that I wasn't aware of, which is uh, our local zoo's involvement with uh, on the international scene. And uh, when one of my board members, uh, Sherry, brought up um, uh, getting in touch with with Tim, we were planning an in-person uh, program with him, and um, and because of what is happening internationally, we we uh, we decided to go forth with it and involve uh, uh, continue our program and talk about animal diplomacy and um, um, the importance of what the zoo does on an international level. So thank you all. Um, very briefly, Tim Morrow, he's the uh, President and CEO of the San Antonio Zoological Society, which operates the zoo. Uh, he is a graduate of Alamo Colleges uh, and UTSA. Um, he has opened parks all around the, the country, um, and as well as in uh, Monterrey, Mexico, which uh, uh, I hope he talks about. I'm sure our friends um, will appreciate that. Um, he's also involved with the International Elephant Fund and um, does a lot of things that, will, that he will bring about. His resume is long. His uh, full biography is in the chat room as well as the zoo's website, um, which he'll refer to. Um, Tim, are you there? I'm here. Tim Murrow, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And I'm just going to wait till the, so we could see you, so you're just not a text. There I am. You are. Well, welcome on board. How are you doing? Thank you. A little stir crazy like everybody right now, but I'm um, doing well, and the, the warm weather is helping everyone feel a little bit better, I think. Tim, tell us a little bit, of, you know, we hear a lot of things. We've heard uh, how the animals are doing. We hear about these awesome Zen classes and yoga classes that you all are doing on Facebook Live. What, uh, tell us a little bit about um, how you're doing and, and what's happening in the next coming weeks and, um, and what your needs are. Sure. Like everybody, we were shut down um, around March 14th when the city really put the, a stay-at-home order and a, a reduction of group sizes. And so the zoo wanted to be a responsible community partner. So we shut down for the health and safety of our um, staff, animals, and the community. And we've been closed ever since. We're one of the, the few zoos in the country that are um, fully funded by visitors buying tickets and spending money at the zoo and donations. We're not supplemented by the city or the county or the state. So we 100% 
depend on visitors and donations to operate. So with the shutdown, it's really put us in a, a tough position where we're really having to depend on, depend on donations now to help um, continue the animal care. So here on staff at the zoo right now is our animal care specialists, our maintenance team that's keeping the life support systems going and the infrastructure going and security really. And that's, that's who's working at the zoo right now. But even that fixed cost of operating the zoo is over $300,000 a week. And so that's the money we're trying to raise right now just to operate and get through this. And then we're really looking forward to reopening. You know, we've been following what the, the president and the governor and the mayor and the, and the, the county judge have been saying about reopening. Um, we've led a group of all the zoos in Texas to kind of give the governor a plan of here's how uh, zoos can open safely, probably starting just with outdoor spaces and things like that. Um, and so hopefully we can start letting some people back in in the next few weeks um, in a safe and healthy way. Great. Um, and I don't know if I was listening to an interview with you or if it was uh, another zoo, but uh, whether the animals know uh, what's going on, I, I imagine yeah. they would. Yeah, that's a great question and I get it a lot. It, it depends really on the animals. Um, our big cats like lions and tigers and jaguars, in, in the wild and both here at the zoo, they sleep about 20 hours a day. So that's what they're doing when I walk by those habitats. Now they're, they're taking their cat naps. Species like the gibbon, I've really noticed the gibbons get excited when they see the employees walking by. And they usually are pretty engaging with our guests. They, they will act silly for the guests and they get reactions out of the kids and they kind of feed off that reaction. So I think they're missing a little bit of that interaction right now. That just shows some givens right there on the video. But so they're doing that now with more of the staff than they usually would. So um, we have a team here that all they do, their entire job is doing a welfare and enrichment for animals. And so we create puzzles and games and we hide scents in there that they can smell and have to find. And we hide food and treats and things like that to keep them mentally and physically stimulated. So we've really ramped up those efforts at a higher level than we were already operating at. Um, but really, I think it's the primates that are noticing the most. Most of the animals, I think it's just another day at the zoo. And I imagine on the flip side, it's probably it's because it's quiet. It, it, it also must be nice for them and a nice uh, change uh, as well. Yeah, first the, the, to, the, to the staff, the quiet was uh, peaceful. Now it's become a little eerie because the sounds of our visitors and especially the kids when they see an animal for the first time in real life or are, you know, something happening they've never seen before, we hear the excitement in the children and things like that. And that, that really helps us um, feel good about and drive our mission even further. So we miss the guests being here in the zoo. And um, I think some animals are noticing, some, some are not. But you definitely walk the zoo now. You hear every animal sound in the zoo, which you can't always hear when you're walking with um, guests inside the zoo. And who knows what they're doing after everyone leaves, right? That's right. It's like Zootopia. I imagine it's like Zootopia and they have a big party while we're all yeah. going. <laughs> not sure. Well, let's dive into a little bit about um, – uh, I, I want to talk about international hunting. I, knew, I know that some people that I talked to – that we were gonna talk to you uh, and have on our program, uh, we're concerned about poachers and, and what that looks like in 2020 around the world. Sure, so poaching is a, still remains a serious problem um, in the United States and internationally, but um, as, as the human race has grown in taking uh, more and more land for development and farming and cities are growing, animals are facing multiple attacks and one is loss of habitat, from development uh, by humans, and the other is uh, poaching. So people illegally hunting animals for either food or feeding into superstitions and beliefs of medicinal purposes of parts of animals that is, is not factual, not true, but it's you know instilled in generation after generation and trying to break that cycle is challenging. So there's big money in poaching. Um, it fuels wars, it fuels drug lords, it fuels a lot of bad things and bad people and um, does a lot of damage. We've lost a lot of species. We're, we're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction on our planet right now. And this one is being caused by man, what we're doing to the planet and what we're doing to these animals in the wild. Wow. I, I, I was watching a documentary on Latin America and elephant tusks and the drug war. Yeah. Uh, that has that kind of waned a little bit because it, I, you don't hear it as much. Well, it's, it's still happening. Around 96 African elephants are killed every day, about one every 15 minutes. Um, Asian elephants, there's probably less than 35,000 left on the planet now, and, and they're still being killed for their tusks. They're still finding it. They're going deeper underground because it, with social media and the, and the awareness of the world now of what it's doing to the elephants, it's, it's had to go deeper underground, I think. Um, it's still a big um, educational piece for 
countries that have those ivory for the things they want to make trinkets and things like that with that what's happening to those species in the wild, which to them are, is a million miles away and they're not affected by it. But um, species like elephants are umbrella species for every other species on that continent. And if they disappear, every species on that continent is in trouble, including humans. So um, there's a lot of efforts to save elephants in really every species. Accredited zoos, AZA accredited zoos, there's about 230 of us. Um, every year put about $120 million back into conservation efforts around the world to help species like elephants. I'm on a, the board of the International Elephant, Elephant Foundation. All it does is uh, focus on elephant conservation in Africa and Asia. And a, a lot of it is just uh, even beyond poaching, just human animal conflict, where if you, you know, have a family farm that you depend on for the entire year to feed your family and make money off of, and elephants can come through and destroy it in one night, um, you know, they are given no other option but to maybe kill these, ele poison these elephants or kill these elephants. So um, groups like zoos and other nonprofits and International Elephant Foundation with that species work really to mitigate the human animal conflict and then do things like sponsor rangers and sponsor ranger stations and build ranger stations where they can be out on patrol and helping protect uh, elephants from poaching. I understand. I do want to have a follow-up, but I'll leave it because it's in relation to Tiger King. So I'll, and it has to do with accreditation, so I'll get back to that. Sure. Um, uh, a serious question at that. Um, I, I, I was doing some uh, research, and I know just from studying international relations that countries have done a great deal, uh, not as much now, but uh, when it comes to animal diplomacy, I know that um, there were some, even in the 1800s, uh, the ruler of Egypt gave giraffes to the international ports uh, to sway them and, and, and to get their, uh, to get behind them. Um, and then we, of course, have the panda diplomacy with China. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I do have a screen to share with everyone to show the, uh, the pandas and with, with Nixon and uh, mm -hmm. have different sorts of animals. And the one with Putin was very interesting because um, it's, it's unsure whether he knew or not if that Merkel was uh, afraid of dogs, but uh, he brought the dog to a press conference and she, she didn't really enjoy that. So you see a lot of times animals being used for enemies and for friends. Um, can you talk a little bit about that aspect of it and, and why we don't see that as much or, or, or is it it's not that as prevalent now? Sure, I think a lot of it is, you know, it's, it, you talk about um, animals coming from Africa to Europe and places like that. It's really how zoos started. They were menagerie collections of the rich and the um, elite of Europe and, and were probably brought there with deals like that when they were working on international relations or business deals. And so that's really how zoos started is menageries of <clears throat> the wealthy in Europe and um, developed into zoos there and then came to the United States. But I think it's as far as diplomacy, you know, the panda is the na a national treasure of China. We have the bald eagle and some other species. Um, Australia has the koala, and so everyone has these really unique species that they like to show off. Um, it probably does not happen as much anymore just because the internet and the way the world has really become so digitally connected that everyone sees those animals all the time anymore. It's not really a rarity um, to see those animals as it used to be. And even with zoos across the world, uh, there's uh, two or three zoos in the United States that have those pan pandas still and are working on breeding programs and scientific programs with those and, and vice versa in other countries. So I don't think it's what it used to be just because the world has grown so fast with the internet and everything else. I see. Okay. Uh, we, have our, we have our first Facebook question. Uh, what do you mean by uh, that poaching has gone deeper underground and uh, what does that look like and what are the new tactics? So I think um, it, it's it's more, people are more aware of it now because of because of this, what I'm talking about with the internet and the world being so connected. People are aware now of the poaching and what's happening in those countries. Where 20 years ago in the United States, we were probably had no idea what the numbers of elephants being poached each day was in Africa. Now we know how many each day are being poached or each hour, and so people have become more aware. Um, the poachers have become more sophisticated, and like I said, they're funding. They're being funded by drugs. They're being funded by wars and sometimes governments um, to make money. And so when you get those organizations involved, it gets much more uh, complicated and sophisticated as far as moving things across international borders, moving money, following money trails and things like that. So I think it's just become um, a, a truer 
um, sophisticated business by just the people that it's supporting um, illegally. We had a follow-up question to elaborate <clears throat> on the benefits to the animals who, where the guests uh, are not coming through uh, and that some zoos are allowing them to walk around. I think I saw some on your yeah. Facebook live. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, we've been taking the animals, uh, some of the animals for a while. So we have what we call an animal ambassador team. So we will bring animals out on pathways um, for families to meet or to schools and things like that. And one of our um, favorite animals to take for a walk is a tamandua. He's like a little anteater species and we take him to walk around by the lions and see elephants and they kind of get to see other animals and other animals get to see them, which is enriching for both of those species. And, um, but you've seen zoos around the world, around the country doing it, the Shedd Aquarium took their penguins for a walk. Um, the, um, I saw recently some kittens were taken from a, a adoption shelter to the Georgia Aquarium to watch the fish in the aquariums. And so um, people are taking advantage of the time to take animals out on walks where they're walkable um, into the zoo just to see other animals as enrichment for the animals that are seeing them and, the, and, and the, as they're doing the walk, what they're seeing as well. So that's been fun to do. We've done it with a few species. Uh, most recently, uh, some of our birds um, our tamandua, we take our um, armadillo out, let other animals see an armadillo, you know, and most those animals have never seen what they're seeing for the first time either. So it's good enrichment for the animals both ways. And that was uh, from Michaela Jonas. So thank you for that question. Um, Tim, talk to us a little bit about, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, not necessarily trade, not international trade, but the movement of animals internationally. Uh, you've done it and other zoos do it. Um, and you have some amazing stuff that I, I, I know a lot of San Antonians don't know about that, yeah. that happens right here in San Antonio. Sure, so a, a large amount of animals in zoos are born and raised at zoos. And one of the things, one, our big, one of our big organizations we're a member of is AZA, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Um, and within that, that association, we have, let's take uh, hippos, for example, because most people know Timothy, our five-year-old hippo, who's in love with Fiona in, in Cincinnati. And so somebody at, at a zoo in, in the AZA is responsible for that species in the care of AZA zoos. And so there's a big database, almost like a match.com for those species to move them around to other zoos. And our goal is, it's called the Species Survival Plan. We want 100 years of good genetics going forward to keep that species prolific in the care of man. Often, sometimes they're being wiped out in the wild um, 100%. Other times they're an endanger. They're on the brink of extinction and things like that. So our goal with those species is to have 100 years of um, sustainability. And so many of the species in our care, I think over 200 of the species that we care for are part of SSP plans, they're called. And so that's how animals are really moved around within uh, the zoos of uh, AZA. And then internationally, kind of that same thing has happened. We're also a member of um, WAZA, which is the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Um, we, have, we have a great, um, all of our staffs are great. We have a great reptile department. We just recently moved uh, a lot of snakes to Russia. <laughs> and so we do a lot of work with uh, montane snakes from Mexico. They were interested in helping to breed those species and um, different zoos have different expertise. One of ours at our zoo is breeding species like snakes. And so uh, we work with that zoo to help to help the breeding programs for all zoos. And so that's really why animals are moved around now is for um, breeding and sustainability and then release back into the wild whenever possible. Is, is, is the, uh, uh, the impact of the relationship of the governments, you said the, you just sent snakes to Russia. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> does that have any impact on, on the work that you do? It does sometimes, and I think uh, Dante, our VP of uh, Conservation and Research, Dr. Finolio is probably on here, but you know, he, he does, um, he leads the project, a lot of our projects around the world, and, and recently we, we've been in Chile for years, there was a fundamental change, and there was really a change in attitude about um, people from the United States having lab work and science projects happening in Chile, so that was an effect on us just in the last couple of years that we're still trying to work through diplomatically. So it does affect as governments change and rules change, relationships between governments change, it can affect what's happening, but we say here all the time that conservation knows no um, state lines, country lines, politics. It's a it's a worldwide issue and a worldwide and needs to be treated worldwide. So um, conservation should not have those boundaries of governmental interference and borders and things like that. It really expands the entire globe, and so that's kind of philosophically how zoos work together on that. 
All right, we have a few more questions. I think uh, Michaela's question is uh, breeding programs. That's what, I missed that part of her question. Sure. Yeah, breeding is that SSP. So the, the species survival plan will move species around to breed. So a couple of examples at our zoo that people know from the last couple of years. Four years ago, we had um, three lion cubs born and people probably remember Tony Parker named the three lion cubs, donated and named three lion cubs. Um, but that mother and that father of those three cubs were moved here specifically to breed together because we had an open lion exhibit. Um, same with our jag, we had jaguar cubs three years ago. The male came from one zoo, the female came from another zoo specifically to breed because they were at the right age and the genetics of those, that, that, that pair, um, we needed more of that genetics in the SSP program. And we've had the opposite situation where um, currently we have Uma, who's an um, elderly hippo. That's a picture of her grandson, Timothy. Right? <laughs> um, so her and Tumbo were here at this zoo for 40 years together and had eight babies. And at some point, the AZA said they should not have any more babies because we've got their gene lines are so well um, established in the AZA that we got to slow that gene line down. And, and then so other species started picking up um, breeding and things like that. Um, Tumbo passed away of old age a couple of years ago. So now Timothy, who is Uma's grandson, has moved back in with grandma. Um, we know that Uma is in the last years of her life. She's already outlived the average lifespan for a hippo. So at some point, Uma will pass away. And that species survival plan for hippos will identify another hippo of breeding age to breed with Timothy. Um, so it, that will either move here or Timothy will move there and those kind of things. So you know, we have our fingers crossed here that Fiona will move from Cincinnati to our zoo, but they'll never let her leave. I don't think the people of Cincinnati or Ohio will ever let Fiona leave the state of Ohio. So, uh, but that's really how that works. And it's to keep those sustainable lines for, try to have it for 100 years. Uh, Tim, I, want, I wanted to get to the, um, the, the, the different trips you've taken and uh, the different projects around the world. Sure. I know you have a few pictures to share but before we do that there are a few more questions um, uh, one is about um, are there any examples this is from uh, the city of San Antonio uh, Sherry Dohalachari are there any examples of collaboration with uh, between uh, the zoo if the zoo has had any collaboration with any uh, other San Antonio partners and sister cities around the world yeah, we have um, a long-term relationship with our sister city in Japan, Kumamoto, and there was an animal exchange, I believe in the 80s, maybe the early 90s, where the San Antonio Zoo sent snow leopards to that zoo, and they sent us Japanese giant salamanders, and that's really how we started into the conservation work of Japanese giant salamanders. So um, that trade between, or the move of those animals between two zoos 20, 30 years ago has, is really what led to us having boots on the ground in Japan and working on Japanese giant salamander conservation. That's a species that lives in the rivers of Japan. A salamander, and I'll show a picture shortly, the salamander that gets three foot plus feet long. Um, but dams have been put in along the river, which has um, created these small spaces where there's not biodiversity of that species anymore. And they, they can't breed outside of that little group that lives in that space. So our zoo is working to create the same concept as a uh, salmon fish ladder that gets salmon past dams. Our zoo's working on creating uh, a salamander ladder, basically that will get the ladder, the salamanders past the dam so they can start breeding again and don't blink on extinction. So that's a good example of a relationship with a sister city that San Antonio has. Uh, and then we, the zoos have a relationship. Same at the Canary Islands. Um, we have not done anything officially with Laurel Park Zoo in the Canary Islands, but we have a, we have a very good personal relationship with that zoo and it's another sister city opportunity. We've talked about what we can do in Namibia, and that will probably be through the International Elephant Foundation. Um, I'm the vice president on that board right now, and I, we're the high, our zoo is the highest level donor to that organization um, because we're really focused on elephant conservation. Um, but that's another example of someplace we want to go and have conversations on what conservation work can San Antonio Zoo bring to this sister city, and how can we work together? If there's a zoo there, how do those zoos work together to do something together? So um, and, and actually, the, the Namib we had a program with the Namibian ambassador uh, just several months ago. So I think yes. um, th this is really, really informative. Sherry had a follow-up, uh, wh which was something that was very tragic um, in <coughs> Australia in our effort, in the efforts that you all had here. Uh, can you address that? She, she mentions how it's, that is what true diplomacy is all about uh, with uh, I don't know how many, at the end of the day, uh, how, how many animals perished, but what a tragedy there, but also the goodwill from around the world, particularly here in San Antonio. 
You talk about Australia. I missed the beginning of the question. Australia, yes. Yeah, so Australia is a country that um, is a continent, a country island that is an island, and so those species are only found there. And so when they had those fires, it's devastating to the entire zoological community because we're losing species that aren't out and other found in other places. And so um, zoos from around the world really got together and started raising funds for helping those animals. Our zoo offered to send. Um, veterinary staff or animal care staff over to help with the rescue and rehab of those um, animals. And then we did a, um, a fundraising campaign through our zoo for people to give to Australia because, you know, what you see in a tragedy like that or a catastrophe is there's a potential for lots of fake nonprofits or fake funds to send money to that you don't know where that money's going, but people trust their local zoos. So what we did in a lot of zoos in the country and around the world, they set up funds within their own local communities and then sent those funds or staff to Australia. So our initial goal was we're going to raise funds to send staff over to help. Um, and we have our staff was ready to go. Ultimately, they had major rains and it really helped with the situation. So they did not need staff on the, on the grounds. We just ended up sending the money to them um, to help supplement that. But we really saw that from zoos around the country and around the world. And, and that's really how zoos operate. Another example of that is when Hurricane Harvey hit Texas. Um, our zoo um, commandeered a helicopter from one of our board members and started flying supplies into the downtown aquarium in Houston. It was under eight feet of water. The staff couldn't move back and forth to the buildings. They were running out of food. They had no power. Uh, so we flew them in inflatable boats and food. We dropped staff off. Uh, we partnered with SeaWorld on dropping some aquarium staff off to that building. Um, and then less than a week later, the Victoria's, the Texas Zoo in Victoria went underwater when the Guadalupe flooded after the hurricane. And so we went down and rescued animals out and worked with every zoo in Texas to place animals. Everyone brought um, holding for the animals. And then we had to find homes for everything to go back out. We had to borrow boats from people, borrow RVs from people, and really go in there and help um, save but that's just how the zoo world works. We're all in, this, it's not a competitive environment at all. We're all in this for one mission and that's conservation and education. So everybody really comes together in those moments, um, nationally and internationally. Wow, that's phenomenal. That yeah. is phenomenal. Um, can you talk, I know there are a couple more questions uh, coming in and, and I, we're gonna get to all of those, but I know you, you also have uh, some, some items to share about your travels and- Yeah, uh, let me share the screen. And, Let's see if you can see that. Can you see that there? Is that, is that, did that pop? Yes. It's on? It is. Okay. Yeah. So this is, I do a lot of presentations around the city or whoever will listen to me talk, I'll go talk to them. So um, we, we often talk about when we do talks about the zoo is um, when someone visits the zoo, it's just a very small piece of the overall effort that the zoo is doing. Really what's happening behind the scenes is uh, the mission that drives us. And so conservation and research is a huge part of what we're doing. And I think Dr. Fenoglio is probably on this call. He leads that department. Um, and he has a PhD underneath him as well. Um, Andy Glusenkamp, who's the director of that department. Um, we have a massive education department. Uh, we operate the, the nation's, probably the world's largest nature-based preschool. We have 236 children that go to our school and a waiting list that gets up to around 900. Um, we also host about 100,000 school kids a year, and then we have docents and educators and volunteers that educate our 1.2 million guests that come every year. And then we really are focused on science um, as far as saving species and, and learning about the species and how to care for them and how to get them to breed. And then we're really focused on being a big part of this community. So we donate a, about a million dollars worth of tickets and um, things back in, and packages back into the community every year. But this is really going to focus on kind of our international footprint of our zoo, which a lot of people don't realize. I didn't really realize before I came to the zoo five and a half years ago. But um, this zoo in San Antonio has, really has an international footprint, and we lead, fund, or participate in projects on nearly every continent. And so that's really a lot of that is done through our, our Center for Conservation and Research here at the zoo. Um, some of the local conservation work we do, we, we've been working with monarch butterflies for 17 years. Um, you know, they funnel right down through San Antonio, like a funnel in, into Mexico where they go to breed. Um, our team volunteers spend the spring and summer netting those butterflies and tagging them with small stickers with numbers. And as they get into Mexico, the forest of Mexico where they breed and, and they die, their wings drop. There's people in Mexico that collect the wings and track those numbers back through us. And we work with Kansas State to really learn more about their um, migration patterns. So that's a, a good example of a collaboration between the United States and Mexico on monarch, monarch, monarch butterfly conservation. Um, that middle picture is a picture of Dr. Fenoglio in the Edwards Aquifer. We do a lot of work right here below our own feet that really 
is going to pay off for um, our entire community in the long run. And then recently, a really fun one we started was um, Texas horned toad or horny toads or horned lizards, as people know them. If you're from San Antonio or South Texas and you've been here a long time, they used to be everywhere and they're disappearing. So the three zoos in Te Dallas Zoo, the Fort Worth Zoo, and the San Antonio Zoo have really divided the state up into three sections and we're working to conserve that species. We have what we call lizard factory here, breeding those. And we'll do our first release later this spring. Uh, it takes us about two years to get a property ready to to uh, release those animals back on, but we work on that for a couple of years with landowners, and then we breed horned toads and release them back out. We even have a trained shelter dog that's trained to sniff out horned toads um, and horned toads scat and horned toads skin so that we can go back to those locations and do counts and see how, see how we're doing. So that's just some of the local work we're doing. Um, these are some, th some species in the United States. So if you drive up 281 and look towards the zoo on your right as you're going north, you'll see a big green warehouse and that's our Center for Conservation and Research. It's an old food and merch warehouse that we converted into this amazing Center for Conservation and Research. And the, the things that are happening in that building are incredible. And so we've been breeding a lot of species that, and we've had some successful births in the last year of species that have never been bred uh, in the care of man before. So this is a blind salamander um, out of Georgia that had never been bred in the care of man. And we're not just trying to breed them, we're trying to figure out what makes them breed and why they breed so that as these species go extinct in the wild, we can kind of write the playbook for this is how you keep these species going and we can breed assurance colonies for re-release back in when the time is appropriate or we can just teach other people how to breed them to get keep their numbers up until we figure out the problems. Um, this is a blind crayfish that we um, were the first to have successful breeding of. Um, this one is very recent, um, a salamander. It's found on I think one pond on an Air Force base and um, they've been trying to breed this for decades probably, and Dr. Finale and his team have figured it out. We have a lot of baby um, salamanders right now of this species. So that's just some of the stuff we're doing around the United States. And then around the world, we're on, uh, like I said, nearly every continent, including the Gulf of Mexico. Um, project Selva, I'll talk about at the end, that's our project in Peru, and really our signature project, protecting rainforests. Uh, the wildcats of Tamaulipas, that's down, you know, just a couple hours south of the border of Texas. There's rainforest with jaguars. We do work down there. We also do sea turtle rescue breeding and release on the coast of Tamaulipas. So we have teams in Mexico all the time. Um, and then the Gulf of Mexico, Dr. Fenolio goes out on a, he calls it a cruise, but it's a boat where you have to strap yourself into a bed at night. So I don't consider it a cruise, but um, they go out and they're really studying the deep sea species of the Gulf of Mexico and, and what the effects of oil spills do to those deep sea species. And that's, a, that's not a drawing, that's an actual picture of an angler fish that Dante took in that, um, on, that, on one of those trips. And I don't know if you recall, last summer, they caught video about 2,300 or almost 3,000 feet down of a giant squid, the first time ever in the Gulf of Mexico. One's been um, captured on video, the second time ever it's been captured on video, but Dr. Finolio and San Antonio Zoo were on that boat when they captured that amazing video. Um, this is a telescope fish, so just another great species of fish that you'll find down there. And if you have kids and you watch um, Disney movies, these are a lot of times um, cartoon fish in Disney movies, but really are real fish. So some of the pictures he brings back are incredible. And I, sometimes I don't even believe it's a real animal, but this is a telescope fish from the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this is Dr. Fenolio and this is some, him doing some work in Chile. So that is where we've set up labs to um, breed and study amphibians in Chile. Um, and we have, a, we have a couple labs down there that we've built. And um, he, Dante's down there every once in a while working with those teams that we have set up in Chile to, breed, to save those species and understand them. This is our work in China. We do subterranean cave work in China. Um, this is a project that's probably sponsored by National Geographic. So um, this was a species that was discovered by our team uh, probably in 2016, I would guess, maybe 17. And it was a big international story of this blind Chinese uh, cave fish. This is a close-up picture of the fish. So we work with a lot of species too that are not the big charismatic species that all zoos are working with. We do that work too, but our conservation team is very focused on uh, subterranean and all these other species and every species matters. This is the Japanese giant salamander project I talked about a little bit that really was born out of our sister city relationship in Kumamoto. And this is Dante in Japan working with some of those salamanders. And you can see that the guy he's got in his hands right there is probably about a three foot salamander. So they get pretty big. Not what a salamander that you would picture here in the United States is like. Um, this is Dante and I in the Amazon last year in the Peruvian Amazon. That's really our signature project down there. This is one of the indigenous groups we work with. Uh, we're working with um, 
local indigenous groups to really help them protect their, their tribal lands of rainforest from encroachment of poacher, uh, of loggers or miners. Um, and so what happens is those, those indigenous groups don't traditionally deal with currency um, until they get sick and need Western medicines, then they need currency. And what happens is miners or loggers will come in and say, we'll give you this medicine if you give us the rights to log and mine your land. So what we've tried to do is create reliable um, ways for them to have revenue without depending on having to sell off their land. So we have a team in Peru. This is some of our team um, that works in Peru. They're all um, locals to Iquitos in Iquitos, Peru. And they go into the indigenous groups and buy all the handmade goods of balsa wood and everything else that those tribes want us to buy. So if they want, if they need, they don't need, really need some money, they say buy 10, we'll buy 10. If they really need money for a surgery or something, or an illness in medicine, they may say buy 10,000, we'll buy 10,000. And we sell those at our gift shops. And so um, to pay for that, to get to those tribes, we had to buy a boat. And the, to, to buy a boat, we had to someone, have somebody take care of the boat. So we had to hire a staff member. And so we had to hire, build an office or buy an office down there to um, ship the goods back to the zoo. So we have really built a full team. And what we really did is really unique. What Dr. Fanelio led was, we've these are all artists in Iquitos. And the team is probably more than half women, which is pretty incredible in Peru leading this effort. But the local proven artists, artists, we taught them the Japanese art of fish printing. So we flew in Japanese fish print artists to teach how to do Japanese fish printing on the fish of the Amazon. And so, uh, so you can see those fish in the background there. And then this is a, that's an actual size of one of the fish, not even a big one. But they do these amazing Japanese fish prints of the Amazon fish and then send those back to us. We frame them. And then we sell them to really fund paying the staff, paying the rent, paying for the boat, which is helping us fund those indigenous tribes and keep them from um, selling their rainforest rights off. So it's really a complicated conservation effort, but it's one that has longevity because it has a funding source. That's not just asking for donations that we're making these fish prints and selling them here at the United States. They were on display in the San Antonio airport for about six months. We've had them on art shows, but beautiful art that we get framed and you can see some of the work they're doing there. And work is really helping protect those indigenous tribes from um, losing their tribal lands. And so that's just some of the work we're doing around the world. And, you know, we're in the usual places, Africa and Asia and Australia and Madagascar and on Komodo Island. And so we send staff out or we're funding and helping and making those projects worldwide just from our zoo right here. So take that and magnify it by all the, the accredited legitimate zoos in the United States and around the world. And it's a, we're a big conservation organization if you put us all together. Wow, that's phenomenal. That's phenomenal for them. Um, I know a few, we had a, we had a couple comments about not being able to see the slides, so I apologize for that. I think some people, I don't know if they had some security settings. I think okay, we can send it out. I'll send it to you and you can send it out or you can post it. And okay. Um, and we're also live streaming this. I didn't mention this in the beginning on Facebook, on the World Affairs Council of San Antonio Facebook. So um, if you find yourself not, um, being able to hear or see something, please switch over. I apologize for that. We, we got on the call about 30 minutes ago to test all this out. So uh, we should be good to go, but I know even with that, um, we don't get 100% of people who are able to um, uh, view the, uh, what we're viewing. Um, a couple more questions, please send. These are amazing questions uh, and we still have a few more things to cover. Um, and uh, JJ Casey, who's one of our board members, um, he is asking about any programs the zoo has to transition wild animals into their natural habitat, if there's anything like that. Sure, yeah. Uh, the one we talked a little bit about was the horned toes that we're doing here in Texas. Um, we do, we work in Puerto Rico with a Puerto Rican crested toad. So we breed, we and a couple of other zoos breed thousands of tadpoles every year put them in bags of water in coolers, fly them over to Puerto Rico. And then we have staffs that go in and build ponds and reintroduce those species back into ponds. Um, we have some birds here that are extinct in the wild that we're working from Guam in places that we're working. To, they're working to get Guam prepared to take birds back. That island was overtaken by snakes and wiped out the birds on that island and th other things happened there. But so there's places where, where there is places to re-release animals back out into the wild zoos are working to re-release those animals back in the wild. There's a lot of cases where there's just nowhere to put these animals back in the wild anymore. Um, so they really become ambassadors at zoos where people can see them up close, learn about them, you know, hopefully fall in love with them, get engaged and really help protect those animals in the wild with things that we teach them that they can do here. But 
yeah, we are involved in several projects where we're re-releasing back out into the wild, as a lot of zoos are. There's been some um, hoof stock in Africa that have been re-released back out in the wild that were extinct. You know, it's interesting, too, in Texas, the ranch community in Texas, a lot of species, there's more of those animals here in Texas now on ranches than there is in their native lands of Africa or Asia because they've just been wiped out by poaching and over, you know, um, habitat loss and things like that. And so um, those programs sometimes tie together and the animals are released back out into the wild as big as hoofstock and other animals like that. Wow. Wow. Well, one of the <clears throat> benefits uh, uh, of, of being quarantined, Tim, is um, I, I, I went on your website and I kept looking at the different things and your different programs you have. And I decided to adopt the giraffe. Oh yeah. Alan. So, Alan, we'll adopt Alan. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I didn't know you, you were able to do that. So uh, now my, my girlfriend and I are uh, proud uh, adoptees of, of Alan. So we look forward to seeing him in person. Yeah, Alan's a great giraffe. That's, um, we have three male giraffes that came from the Gladys Porter Zoo in Brownsville. And so we'll, we have what's called a bachelor group. So um, we have Alan, who's the dad, and then he's got two half or two sons who are half brothers, um, Braden and Cosmo. So that's the three giraffes we have at our zoo. And, but, and they're uh, a lot of fun. You, you, there's a video of Alan right behind me, but uh, they're coming right on cue. This is incredible on the video, but um, <laughs> we opened that experience in 20, late 2015, where you can actually go out into the savannah now and feed giraffes face to face, which is an incredible moment. If you, it's one thing to see animals on video or see them on TV, but when you're up close to a giraffe or up close to a Galapagos, tortoise or up close to these birds or our hippos um, you really get a new appreciation for the animal and care more about them all right um, I want to get we have about 15 minutes uh, please keep your questions coming uh, you know during with COVID-19 and all the news about um, the uh, wet markets in China um, that the Chinese government recently um, said that they were not allowing any more uh, wild animals to uh, uh, any domestic trade, but they were actually giving tax incentives for exporting those animals. Um, what are your thoughts on these wet markets, which are, you know, being an animal lover, uh, it's, it's hard to see some of those things. Yeah. What, are there any... Um, efforts from uh there are some obvious ones I, I guess internationally but some things that you may be involved in yeah there's a um a big effort right now and it's going through congress in the united states and it's being um led by zoos and some other organizations to really um put some pressure on china to stop those wet markets and shut those down as the consumption of poached animals and wild animals in those markets um is like we're seeing with this COVID, is leading to a lot of problems and so the conditions are horrible. Um, the animals are kept in terrible condition. Um, and it's just a breeding ground for viruses and everything else you can imagine that's healthy. And then it's le it leads to poaching and other problems we have. So they talk about the, the, the markets there now where there was pangolin and those were poached out of Africa. Pangolin is the most poached animal on the planet. And um, it's, you know, there's a superstition that the, the scales are healthy for you and can give you magical purpose or good luck and things like that and the meat is eaten and things like that so th those wet markets lead to poaching um, and then the conditions of those wet markets lead to problems for humans and animals so we're hoping that they'll be shut down the government of china has been um, slowly making progress as far as um, animal parts coming in um, with elephant trunks and ivory and things like that it's been a slope but it's been you know it's a generations of people with a thought system of um, or tradition of we make trinkets out of ivory. We, that's what we do. We carve ivory or we eat this animal because it gives us good luck. We eat this animal because it helps us medicinally when it's, it's all been disproven medically and every other way you can disprove it. It's just been ingrained for generations. So it's, it's probably going to take generations to unwind that. And so that's what really, I think a lot of the world is focusing on is unwinding some of those beliefs and, and trying to save these species before they're just wiped out with consumption. We have a couple questions uh, from uh, Michaela, and I think, oh, the naming of the animals. That's a good question. How do you all name the animals? It's different all the time. We have, there's some funny stories. We have um, bush dogs who are all named after Star Wars characters. And so that was probably 
um, some animal, the animal keepers of those dogs um, named them. Sometimes we have auction donations. We're a 501c3 nonprofit, so we need donations and funds. So sometimes we'll auction a name off to, get, to give a, what we call a Texas name. Um, and then oftentimes they're named after traditional names of where they come from. Um, another funny story is we have um, three wild dogs that came from the Oklahoma City Zoo, three brothers. Um, and when they got there, I asked what their names were. And one of them was named Thunder after the basketball team. So they got us. They snuck one in on us one day. But they literally <laughs> named a dog Thunder and sent it to us. So um, that's when the Spurs and the Thunder had a big rivalry going. But um, it's really oh, wow. it's really different all the time. And, and it, there's no fat rule for it. It's just um, – Really, the, keep, the keepers most of the time are the ones who name the animals that spend all the time with um, raising them and caring for them. Usually, the, we let the keepers name the animals. Sometimes, we will have donations for um, like nicknames or Texas naming rights, we call it. Um, and then sometimes, they come from other zoos with names already, and we just stick with that name. Some animals, animals will know their name. Like, our elephants know their names. Our rhinos know their names and things like that. So, um, we try to stick wow. with them. Well, I'm a little disappointed, Tim. I don't see any Armin Babajanians there. Not yet, but there's a chance to donate someday, and you can have your name on <laughs> <laughs> um, Some There was a question about the Jaguar cat, uh, catwalks for Jaguars. Yes. Is, that, is that something that y'all are – Yeah, so we designed that, and that, that, pro that project has been slowed down twice now by really circumstances of what was happening around the zoo. But we designed uh, – and we've really <laughs> – working with local architects. So this one was done by um, Overland Partners. And what I like working with Overland is they're not traditional zoo designers, so they don't just copy and paste what they've seen at other zoos or what they've done before. And so it's a really unique design for our Jaguars. Right now we have two Jaguars. Um, they're solitary in the wild, so we're, they're solitary here as well. Um, but we'd like to be able to, instead of shifting them back and forth between their, their living room and out on the, into the habitat, we'd like to be able to have more space. So uh, we're working to create an overhead Jaguar walk, which would take the Jaguars from their existing space. They'd be able to go up into basically a netted tunnel system and sit overhead with the get, watching the guest, which um, we know they would like to do. And naturally in the wild, they sit up in trees and hunt and take their prey into trees and things like that. And then um, something really unique about this one is it, it will go through into another exhibit. So it'll go through our Amazonian bird aviary and give them a space down by the river to have some space as well, which is another natural behavior for Jaguar to sit by a river and hunt on a river. And then it hooks up into another, the former Jaguar exhibit. So really it probably gives them four or five times the space they have now with a really unique um, catwalk system or, or tunnel system that's meshed. And so um, that was, our goal was to have that open in 2018. And at the time we had one um, rhino um, named Kutu who is 16 years old. Uh, we knew we wanted to start breeding rhinos again. We were the first zoo in the Americas to breed um, rhinos. So we have a long history with rhinos and rhino conservation. We, we got word that there was, through the SSP of rhinos, because now we all know what SSP is, there's two young females ready to come to our zoo um, together as part of the SSP. Well, Kutu was too old to be with them. Um, so we ended up moving Kutu to another zoological facility. And we, that was the only opportunity we would really ever have to redo our rhino exhibit. So that bumped in front of Jaguar. And so last year, the last 18 months, we took what was an exhibit of three different um, spaces and created one big space, added a waterfall, a little pond, a creek, some trees, landscaping, and really made it more natural and then brought in the two Southern Whites we have now. And that's kind of been the philosophy of the zoo the last few years is, um, we talked earlier about zoos used to be menagerie collections of the wealthy in Europe and, and zoos in America used to be judged by how many animals you had and whoever had the most animals because the only place you could see those animals was visiting a zoo. You didn't have YouTube and the internet. Now zoos are judged by how natural are your habitats for the animals? How enriching are they for the animals? How much education are you doing? How much conservation are you doing? So we've really been kind of reducing the amount of animals we have, but creating bigger natural spaces for the ones that we do have. And, and that's been a focus of ours. And so that's what we did with rhino. We did that with giraffe a couple years before that elephant a couple years before that we expanded that and brought the other elephants in we've expanded lion now and so we don't need to have every single species we need to focus on species that align with our mission with our conservation efforts and really build natural enriching habitats for them going forward so jaguar was my rhino and then now it was and now we were we were literally in the middle of fundraising for it when covid hit so now we're fundraising basically to save the zoo and then once we get back up on our feet and operationally sound again We'll come back to Jaguar, but it's been, I've wanted to do, we've wanted to do it for three, four years now, and it's going to be an amazing habitat once we get it done. We just have to 
continue to fundraise for it once we get past this um, um, pandemic. Wow. Well, we look forward to seeing that. Uh, one item I missed, my, our mutual friend, Stephanie Alkenfels from CPS Energy, uh, informed me that there's the Bat Coalition International yes. that's based in Austin, and, and also the migration of bats this, you know, toward uh, going north. What, can you talk a little bit about that uh, from Mexico? Yes, so the, the free tail bats, the perfect example, and um, they live the winters in the caves in Mexico. And then the, at the beginning of spring, around February, they come out of the caves and head to Texas and um, come like the, the Bracken Cave is a good example of a large, I think it's the largest ma collection of mammals on the planet um, is that Bracken Cave. You know, you can see that on weather radar when they come out of their caves, that uh, shows up, but they come up here to have their babies and um, really raise their babies and then they learn how the babies learn how to fly during the summer. They come out and hunt. They're very important to um, pest control, to crop reproduction. So very important to our environment. And then at the end of summer, they migrate back down to Mexico. So every year they're moving back and forth between Mexico and um, San Antonio or Texas and the United States, which goes back to what I was saying is, you know, these conservation efforts and these migrations don't know geographical or political um, boundaries. So it's important that conservation efforts are able to um, kind of cross those lines and make that mesh invisible. Very cool. Very informative stuff. Yeah. Yeah, very uh, uh, things that, that I know a lot of our uh, viewers did not know about, uh, both locally and internationally. Um, and the other the other thing that we've done being quarantined is run through Netflix and watch all these crazy shows. Um, you know, there's a funny side to Tiger King as far as the characters involved and all these memes, but. As far as a, as far as an animal advocate and someone who works for the zoo, what has, uh, what has been your impression of more, not necessarily the, uh, the, the program itself, but the reactions to it and, and uh, anything positive out of it other than entertainment? I think the positive that, if there's anything positive that came out of that movie, it's the awareness of the plight of tigers in the wild. You know, they talk about the numbers of the less than 4,000 in the wild. And, and that's a good example of a species that has just lost habitat and, and could thrive in the wild, was thriving in the wild, but so much of the habitat is gone now that um, they're in really bad shape. So um, it's hard to watch for some people that work at accredited zoos like San Antonio Zoo and, you know, Dallas, Fort Worth and the ones you know of, it's really hard to watch that show and it's really hard to hear when they call themselves a zoo because anyone can call themselves a zoo. And that's an example of a roadside, what we would call a roadside zoo that's not accredited. Um, it's just really an animal breeding facility for profit. And so there's most likely inbreeding going on there. There's other things happening when the tiger cubs are not useful anymore that I don't even want to talk about that probably happened there and those kind of things. So as a zoological professional and especially my animal care staff and people that work at accredited zoos, that is really hard um, to watch. And we have, we have tigers here in the San Antonio Zoo, right? Yeah, we have a species that San Antonio Zoo takes care of, the Sumatran tiger, um, the smallest of the tigers. So when I go to other zoos and I see their big species of tigers, it makes mine look like, uh, ours feel like a house cat, but um, incredible animals and they need to be respected and cared for in the proper way. And, um, you know, one of the things is when people come and spend money at zoos and buy a ticket and not only are they supporting our zoo operation, they're really supporting those conservation efforts that we're doing or that we're funding in other parts of the world. So there's nonprofits all over the world that are trying to save tigers, save okapis, save elephants, save, and our zoo sends, and other zoos send money to help those nonprofits in their home countries do the work they're doing. And so just by visiting, which a lot of people don't realize, just by visiting a zoo, you're helping with those conservation efforts. And that's a big separation between what accredited zoos are doing and non-accredited facilities is we're not just caring for animals here. We're working around the world to save species in the wild as well. Tim, we got a few more minutes left. Um, sure. <clears throat> thank you for coming on. Really appreciate oh, my pleasure. what you all do and your staff, uh, your team out there. Um, I know a lot of big fans of, uh, of, of, the, of the animals there and, and the programs and all the educational programs that you all have. Yeah. Um, and I encourage people to go and check them out on Facebook. Um, their website is in the, chat, uh, in the chat room, so please click on that to support um tim's and the zoo's effort and um they're going through a really tough time as a lot of nonprofits are but mm -hmm. uh, you know it's important to uh keep you know what's san antonio without a zoo right right it's uh you know we we, 
we always talk about that with the World Affairs Council is if we don't have people talking about international issues, um, who else is going to do it? So please click on that. Uh, adopt an animal. Not Alan, though. Keep your hands away from Alan. <laughs> um, but any any departing, uh, any final words uh, before I uh, I give closing remarks? We just really we appreciate the um, the way our community has wrapped their arms around us through this hard time. You know, we've seen the donation, a big uptick in the donations. Um, we understand that there's, you know, it's, it's a triple whammy for us right now. A lot of their oil is a big industry in Texas and, um, that's way down, which hurts donations and things for nonprofits. The market going crazy is hurting donations and things like that. And then there's just the need for health and human services. I mean, you've seen those pictures and videos of the food bank and the great work they're doing in the lines for that food. So we totally understand that that's the focus of a lot of corporations and people donating right now. And we just don't want to be forgotten. We have a lot of animals to care for and staff to care for and, we're 106 years old, um, cultural en entity in this town. We will be here for the next 106 years, which we will, but uh, we appreciate everyone supporting us. And you know, we've really grown in the last five years. We've reinvested about 50 million into the property with um, upgraded habitats. We've added the new parking garage now, which is about to get some gorgeous animal art on it that's going to blow people's minds. Um, we brought Park over. We saved Kitty Park from going away, and so we brought Kitty Park over. Uh, we just recently added a Starbucks in the park in Brackenridge, so that's helping us. And, and all those things like Kitty Park and Starbucks and the train in the park, that really, we call those mission enabling. And so us being able to have those um, additions to our zoo, all the funding from that goes to fund our mission, our, our mission enabling departments like conservation research, animal care and education. So um, all these things, and our school is probably one of the most amazing things I've ever, ever been a part of in my life. What's happening there is amazing. We're, we're we're really raising the next generation of conservationists and quick fun story about that. When we're building the parking garage on the other side of next to the school, that is an old, our site on that side of 281 is the old city dump. There's an old incinerator there and things like that. So it was a one point cleared. All the trees on that side are scrub trees, non-native trees, but we cleared the space to put the garage. We have a big, we had a big plan to come back with like a hundred trees, which we did. But when we were clearing the site, the kids at the school, these are three, four and five year olds were, almost in panic that there was deforestation and that is the word three-year-olds are using at the school deforestation happening next to the school so we had to go talk to the kids at Wilson Zoo School which is really inspiring to go to have to go have that talk that these kids are the next generation of conservationists and explaining to them these were invasive species of trees we're bringing back natural trees which will bring back some natural animals and things like that but um, what's happening at that school is amazing and the staff at this entire zoo is the best in the field I, I can guarantee San Antonio has the best staff zoological and educational staff in the field. Tim Morrow, President and CEO <clears throat> of the San Antonio Zoological Society, which operates the San Antonio Zoo. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. I know I learned a whole lot. Uh, we will send the link out to this, uh, which will be on YouTube uh, to everyone. Um, and we will also, if it's all right with Tim, we'll, we'll add your email. If sure. uh, anyone has any follow-up questions, um, and we also have some programming coming up, um, and let me just share that with you all really quick. That's not it. Oh, there we go. Okay, so we have, next week we're doing only an Instagram Live with our very own board member, um, JJ, John JJ Casey. Uh, after that, we will be li live from the UK. Well, we won't, I won't be, I'll be here at home, but uh, the person we're, we're discussing the global economy with is Dr. Christopher Hartwell, um, and he will be coming in live from the UK. And then we have our very own Ambassador Luis Moreno, who will be uh, online. All of this can be found um, on uh, our website and if you are tuning in you will also get an email follow-up uh, about this uh, you know we definitely need as Tim was saying as a nonprofit uh, we, we we have seen a decline in our um, memberships we actually we haven't we haven't had any new members in the last two months um, so we really want you to look at if you've enjoyed this program to look at either becoming a member uh, or becoming a donor. And uh, Magdalena's putting those links as well in our chat room um, so that you can uh, uh, make that donation if you uh, choose to do so. We really appreciate it. 
Um, and we look forward, we can't do this without your support and uh, to have people like Tim on to share their stories about their national arena. Thank you all for tuning in. I expect a follow-up email from me with all of this combined so that you haven't missed anything out, including those slides that some of you missed. Uh, Tim Morrow, thank you again. Ladies and gentlemen, you have a great week, and we'll see you next week on Instagram Live.